Let's cultivate our motivation. So two of the chief elements that are necessary for full awakening are bodhicitta on the method side of the path and the wisdom realizing emptiness on the wisdom side of the path. Those two are often called the two bodhicittas. Conventional bodhicitta, the aspiration for full awakening for the benefit of all beings, and ultimate bodhicitta, the mind that directly perceives the ultimate nature of reality, emptiness of true existence. So we have uh, a lot of work ahead of us to actualize these two, which are necessary to become fully awakened Buddhas. But we also have great potential and a wonderful opportunity to do that. And it is there is nothing, nothing in the world more valuable than generating the two bodhicittas and attaining awakening. So no matter how long it takes, no matter the bumps in the road that we experience, we've found the correct path, we've found the teachings that will show us the way there, And so we must have very strong conviction and self-confidence. And in that way, really have the unshakable resolve, the pure determination to follow this path, to develop it, to gain all the realizations and attain the result of Buddhahood. So let's generate that determination now. So on our path to Buddhahood, we'll hit some bumps in the road. And what are the bumps in the road? Nothing other than the second truth, the origins of dukkha, which are afflictions and polluted karma. And so we have uh, talked a lot about affliction so far. In a previous volume, we talked about karma extensively. And here in chapter five of Samsara, Nirvana, and uh, Buddha Nature, we'll talk about the seeds and latencies of afflictions and karma. Because these seeds and latencies also are what obscure our mind and uh, bring obstacles in our practice. So here we go. Okay. So Sanlina says, true origins of dukkha are those phenomena that give rise to cyclic existence and are in the nature of dukkha. Okay, unsatisfactoriness. Okay, true origins, this is the second of the four truths, 
consist of afflictions, which are rooted in ignorance, and polluted karma, actions created under the influence of ignorance, that produce the three types of dukkha. Okay, three types of dukkha are the dukkha of pain, the dukkha of change, and pervasive, the pervasive dukkha of conditioning. Okay, so these are our uh, very um, well-known friends, so we should at least know their names and uh, what they do, what their specialities are. So of afflictions and karma, afflictions are chief because they give rise to karma and also act as conditions for karma to ripen. Okay, so in the evolution, first there's ignorance, then there's afflictions, then there's karma. Okay, the afflictions and the karma are distinct. Lots of times people think, Everything happens because of karma, as if afflictions play no part in creating the karma. Or they think the karma ripens and then the affliction or afflictions arise because the karma ripens. No, the uh, afflictions are, are what create the actions, and the actions leave. The actions are the karma. Okay? So don't don't get these two mixed up in their order. Yeah. So without the presence of afflictions, polluted karma cannot be created. Okay? So afflictions first, they create the karma. Okay. And even if seeds of previously created karma remain in our mind streams, they cannot ripen into dukkha without the presence of afflictions. Okay, so afflictions create the karma, and then they also act as uh, some of the conditions for karma ripening. Yeah? Because when our mind is afflicted, it's very it becomes so much easier for destructive karma to. Uh, ripen in our lives and bring manifest dukkha. Okay. So, uh, and also because if the afflictions are eliminated, like for an arhat or an eighth ground bodhisattva, then the karma producing rebirth in samsara cannot ripen. Okay. So in the context of the 12 links of dependent origination, which we will come to after a few chapters, okay, the 12 links that describe how we cycle in samsara, karma refers to volitional actions done under the force of afflictions that bring rebirth in cyclic existence. So it's very clear that uh, the... The karma are volitional actions, okay? So they're things where there has been an intention. Sometimes people talk about karma as if uh, it just kind of happens or there's no intention, you accidentally do something, or the karma, uh, you know, creates the earthquake, Uh, You know, there's a lot of different misunderstandings about what karma is. Or some people think of karma as fate or predetermination. Why does something happen? Oh, it's karma. Okay. His Holiness says when people say that, what they're really saying is, I don't know. Why does that happen? It's karma. In other words, I I don't know. Yeah. So we often don't really understand what karma is and the fact that afflictions are what create the karma. Okay. So karma's volitional actions, you know, we do this all the time. Yeah. So this is a, um, a more specific meaning of karma than used in volume two where we spoke of many kinds of actions 
not all of which propel rebirth. Okay, but when we talk about the 12 links, we're talking specifically about actions that uh, is called propelling karma that have the power to bring a rebirth. Yeah, it's not actions that are completing karma that complete the different um, conditions of the rebirth. It's not like that. It's the ones that actually mature into uh, the aggregates of a specific realm. To attain liberation, the stoppage of uncontrolled rebirth in samsara, we need to eliminate the afflictive obscurations that cause it. These are ignorance, all the other afflictions that it produces, and the seeds of these afflictions. Okay. So this is exactly what I was going to say, but it's I put it in a footnote. So here we note a difference between true origins, the second of the four truths, which include karma and afflictive, uh, kar- which include karma, the difference between two or true origins, and afflictive obscurations, which do not include karma. Okay, afflictive obscurations are the things that prevent uh, liberation. So they're the afflictions and the seeds, but the true origins are the afflictions, the seeds, and the seeds of the afflictions and the karma that's created and the seeds of that karma. Okay, once afflictions are overcome, the the karma causing rebirth can no longer ripen. Okay. So in this chapter, we will investigate different types of afflictions and karma. So here, you know, before we already went through the list of the the different kinds of afflictions and the different categories and, and things like that. So here we're going to talk about karma in terms of acquired, uh, afflictions and karma, in terms of acquired and innate afflictions, coarse and subtle afflictions, underlying and manifest inflictions, seeds and latencies of afflictions, seeds of karma, and something called having ceased. Having ceased. Yeah. So we'll get to that. So knowing these expands our understanding of the works, workings of our mind, the evolution of samsara, and the path to liberation. Okay? Because all of these are things that are active in our lives and that we have to deal with in one way or another if we're going to purify the mind and become Buddhas. Okay, so first, acquired and innate afflictions. We've talked a bit before about them before, but here we'll talk about them in a little bit more depth. Okay, so afflictions are of two kinds. Yeah, so this is one way of categorizing afflictions. As I mentioned in the previous paragraph, there's several different ways. This is one way. Okay, so afflictions are of two kinds, innate and acquired. So innate afflictions have been with our mind stream since beginningless time. Okay, so there was no origin to innate afflictions, okay? Just as there was no origin to uh, to our samsara. It's just beginningless, okay? And with innate afflictions, we did not learn them from anyone, And they continue from one rebirth to the next. So we are born with these afflictions. Yeah? And it happens very naturally. It's not like at the end of one life we, uh, you know, have to generate a motivation. May I be reborn with innate afflictions. They just come by themselves, and you know, with the next rebirth. Okay? Um, So innate afflictions are present in babies, animals, insects, and beings born in other samsaric realms. So we often think of babies and children as very pure, 
Uh, not exactly. They come in to life, you know, the ordinary beings, the ordinary babies, with afflictions, and also with the seeds of afflictions and with the seeds of karma. Okay? So uh, they're not blank slates when they come in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at no time in our wandering in samsara have we been free from afflictions. That's scary, okay, from the innate of inflictions. There is no time when our mind has been freed of them. Okay, so nobody created them, nobody forces us, us to have them. There's no story of a snake and an apple. There's, you know, just this continuity of innate afflictions that do not go away on their own. Okay, and there's, you can't get uh, herd immunity from afflictions in society. Okay. Because the innate inflictions just, uh, you know, they're always there. It's like something on your computer that you pre keep pressing cancel and it keeps popping up on your screen. Okay. So, so that's innate afflictions. Acquired afflictions are those learned in this lifetime through adopting the flawed reasoning of mistaken philosophies and ideologies. Okay, so acquired afflictions, yeah, they're acquired in this lifetime because we have studied incorrect philosophies and ideologies, or sometimes they say incorrect uh, psychologies, you know, different ideas that human beings have made up that are not correct, and we learn them. And our society teaches us them, okay? So you could say, uh, instead of acquired afflictions, you could say conspiracy theories. You know, they're just things that you listen to different people talk about, and, you know, like a lot of people think this way, and sounds kind of reasonable, although I don't completely understand. So, yes, I adopt those kind of views as, as well. Okay. For example, we may study a philosophy that asserts a permanent soul or an inherently existent creator and come to believe the arguments presented for their existence. Okay, so usually with acquired afflictions, there's some kind of arguments backing them up, although the arguments are completely off the wall. But we kind of hear them and, yeah, you know, it, yeah, why not? It sounds, yeah. What's the new thing uh, in in mirror that the uh, the horse dewormer that supposedly cures COVID now? Yes, yes. This is the the new conspiracy theory. This horse dewormer, which many people are buying and taking, yeah, will cure COVID. Yeah, you read it on social media, it seems completely, well, it's just as good as, what was the first one, Hydro hy hydrochloroquine or something, you know, and, uh, you know, it tastes better than, than Clorox, so, which was the other thing that was recommended. Uh, so, yeah. That, yeah, that one contained the hydrochloroquine or whatever it was. Yeah, so this is the, the new things, you know. So this is, this, is what, this is what I'm talking about, how the acquired afflictions, or acquired, yeah, acquired afflictions come in the mind, you know. Read something, it sounds good, you know. Okay, so the, the, this example that I gave of, of the uh, horse, Dewormer is not an affliction, okay? That is definitely a conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. Although I thought conspiracy always meant that two people had to plan it together. But I guess not anymore. 
you can conspire with yourself. <laughs> okay, anyway. So here, I mean, the most the frequent ones we come into are a view that there's an inherently existent person or a permanent soul or a creator god. Okay, so these are some examples of them. Or the nihilistic ones that, you know, after death, there's nothing, you know, it, everything just stops. Okay, so innate and acquired self-grasping ignorance do not differ in terms of how they grasp the object. Okay, they, both of them grasp it as inherently existent. So they're not different in terms of the object they grasp or how they grasp it, okay? They differ in that the innate self-grasping ignorance is deeply ingrained and arises frequently and spontaneously. And that's the one that comes with us from one life to the other, okay? It doesn't matter whether you don't, when you move from one country to another, okay, uh, your your innate afflictions and also the acquired ones, they don't need visas, okay? So the U.S., uh, in, in when they're, they're rescuing you from Afghanistan, you cannot leave your afflictions behind. They, you don't need a visa, okay? They just come with you, whether you want them or not, okay? Deeply ingrained. They arise frequently and spontaneously. Acquired self-grasping, okay, self-grasping ignorance, is learned in this life through reflecting on fallacious reasonings. Like, well, there's a real soul. There's got to be something that really is me. Otherwise, yeah, if there's no soul, then what's going to carry the karma from one life to the other? Okay? Or if there's no soul, then at death everything stops, and that's too scary whereas a soul provides some kind of feeling of comfort. You don't go out of existence at death. You continue on in some kind of form, even if it's in, where is it? Um, we were talking about the other day, uh, purgatory, yeah, or what was the other one? Limbo, Limbo yeah. Purgatory and limbo. Sorry, I, I, I didn't grow up Christian, so I don't know these terms. Okay. But, um, you know, for many people, the idea that, that you have a soul that's, you know, hopefully going to go to heaven and not all these other places, uh, then that really gives a lot of comfort. You know, it gives emotional comfort to people. And I even know people uh, who, you know, became Buddhists because theistic religions didn't make sense to them. But then when somebody dies, they go back to kind of praying to God and thinking about their soul going to heaven. And, and one person said to me, you know, that's just much more comforting than thinking about rebirth, you know? Thinking about there, there's a God that's in charge. There's a God who understands what's going on. Even if what is going on is totally bananas and crazy, there's God who understands it all and makes it happen, it sounds like. So for some people, this is just very, very comforting, you know? And the Buddhist view of that we're reborn according to our own actions, and there's no God who can sweep down and, uh, you know, send you to heaven, or, yeah, or no God that you can please so that you really will go to heaven. Um, you know, they, they find that very scary, yeah. Okay. 
So acquired self-grasping is learned in this life through reflecting on fallacious reasonings. Although innate self-grasping ignorance is the root of cyclic existence, the acquired version is especially insidious because it is based on thinking about how things exist in an incorrect manner and reaching erroneous conclusions. Okay, so the innate uh, ignorance, it doesn't have any reason. It just grasps inherent existence. The reason the acquired one is so bad is it has all these reasons. So you'll notice the acquired one coming up in your meditation when you're trying to meditate on emptiness and this mind that comes up that says, but emptiness doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Or emptiness means nothing exists. Or something like that. So that's the acquired one that comes up and gives the wrong reasons, you know, to get us to believe in inherent existence. Mm -hmm. And and that's the one, you know, when, uh, yeah, for, for people, like when a dear one dies, yeah, you see the casket and you don't see a body, you see a person. It's actually just a body. Yeah, not all five aggregates are there. You don't have the actual basis of designation of a person. But the misconception mind sees a person. Yeah, and maybe that person has gone to heaven or something else. Yeah, so this kind of view is is, is, is very pervasive. Yeah, even and some Buddhists even have this kind of feeling too, when when somebody dies, yeah, because they haven't studied, they don't know. Okay, so the innate one, the afflict, the acquired one is based on your wrong reasoning and thinking about things in a misconstrued manner and coming to wrong conclusions. It may cause someone to cling to wrong views and be unreceptive to teachings on emptiness. Okay? So you can see, yeah, and we see people will come to Dharma teachings and they want to listen, and then they listen, and then they say, this is crazy. You know, these people talking about rebirth and, uh, you know, it's... What are they talking about? And uh, so the, these acquired uh, acquired ignorance, you know, blocks their mind from being uh, receptive because they already have so many beliefs about how things are. You know, like some people come and, well, there's one, one universal mind, okay? And we are all parts of this universal mind. And at the time of creation, uh, each of us, our, our mind or our soul broke off from this universal mind and we became individuals. And liberation is when we leave this body and we all dissolve back into the universal mind. Sounds good, huh? Yeah? It doesn't sound too good. Don't get too excited about it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. And so then some people say, then, you know, uh, I don't know, rebirth, and sometimes you're born up, and sometimes you're born down. Yeah. We should always be going up. Yeah, everything's getting better. Okay. So strong clinging to identities of this life, our nationality, our religion, our ethnicity, our race, our socioeconomic class, our educational level, uh, our gender, our sexual orientation, and so on, all these identities are acquired afflictions. 
Okay. The acquired afflictions cannot ri- arise without the innate ignorance. Okay. But this, uh, you know, all these acquired identities we were not born with. Yeah. We learn them in this life and then we grasp them with a, aqu- you know, because we have the innate ignorance that leads to the acquired ignorance, then each of these identity we, we grasp as me. This is who I am. And you better recognize who I am and respect my rights and listen to my story. Yeah. And it's gotten, in recent years here, it's gotten this thing of identity has gotten so strong and really created, I think, quite a a lot of uh, division among people, you know. Talking about your identities in terms of, you know, wanting equality for people of all different sorts of identities, that's good. But the way identity is being grasped now as, you know, this is who I am and you're not respecting me and society is prejudiced against me and on and on and on and on. Yeah, it creates so much anger in one's own mind and anger against other people who are not treating us according to how we think people with our identity should be treated. Do you have any of this kind of uh, afflicted self-grasping? <laughs> yeah. So we learn these identities in this lifetime, and we're taught to be attached to them. Okay. But this, you know, my story. You know, I was brought up Jewish. My identity is. 4,000 years, people have been trying to kill us and exterminate the Jews, okay? And so we've always fought back. We've always continued to exist, and we're persecuted, and they're going to come after us again. So be careful, okay? And then you look around in America today and all the attacks on synagogues, okay? All the renewed swastikas in places, all the, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of anti-Semitism now. And you'd say, see, told you so. It decreases for a while, but it's always there. And they come back and look at these people trying to exterminate us, even in America. Okay? So you have the Anti-Defamation League. Yeah, which notices uh, anti-Semitism and calls it out. But I've got to say that the anti-defamation need is good. It doesn't just call out discrimination against Jews. It talks about all the different ethnic groups. And it really stands up for equality or equity in, in our society. Anyway, we learn these identities in this lifetime, and we were taught to be attached to them. Okay, I am a woman, I am a man. This is the way a woman is, this is the way a man is. Okay, this is, or, you know, whatever ethnic group. Yeah, this is my ethnic group, and na 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 And the whole white supremacy, you know, I'm white, therefore blah, blah, blah. All this is the acquired afflictions. Okay, so we then think, I am a this and that, and you should treat me in such and such a way. While the specific identity is acquired, the mind that clings to I am is innate. Okay? So the whole thing always comes back to the innate ignorance. Acquired afflictions cannot come about without their innate forms. Oh, just what I said. Um, Acquired afflictions abound, and cause terrible suffering. Okay? For example, innate anger exists in our mind streams. If someone teaches us false reasons why a particular racial or ethnic group is inferior or violent, 
We may believe these and have strong prejudice and anger towards anyone in that group. Okay? So the innate, innate anger is there, but then we learn to hate different groups. Okay? So it's interesting to think in how, how you were brought up, you know, what you were taught to favor and what you were taught to be suspicious of, different kinds of groups of people or whatever. Okay. Holding the, the belief, this land is mine because a religious scripture, scripture said so, is acquired attachment. Okay. That Acquired attachment is what lies behind the one of the things that lies behind the whole conflict, uh, pa- the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, this land is mine. Why? Because a religious scripture said so. And you can inevitably find a religious scripture which will say whatever you want it to say. Yeah. I have the theory, first people decide what they believe, then they find a scripture to to quote, to validate it. Yeah. Thinking killing the enemies of my people is justified by this uh, political theory or religious belief is acquired hostility. Yeah. So some religions teaching, teach, you know, um, or, or, well, political things, but religions too, you know, it. I should kill the heathens. Yeah, the heathens are going to destroy my faith. They're, they don't respect God. We should kill the heathens. Yeah? And, and if you kill uh, the heathens, you will go to heaven. This, this theory is alive and well. You know, ISIS, this is, a, ISIS is, champion statement, okay? Or, you know, killing the enemies of my people. You're in a, I belong to a specific uh, racial group or a specific uh, uh, nationality. And, you know, these other people across the border, they're always coming to get us. Or this minority in our own country, you know, they don't respect us and no, whatever it is. Okay, so that's all acquired. My racial or ethnic group is morally superior is an example of acquired arrogance. You hear this one too, don't you? Yeah, that's why, you know, when, if, if, I mean, have you ever noticed in every single war, God is behind the army. Yeah. I think God has a really hard time in wars because the, all the parties that are fighting, they all claim God is on their side. Yeah. And so therefore, we are morally superior to these people who it is our job to, you know, get rid of because they don't appreciate God and they are harming us and we are the one faithful ones who follow God and all of God's, you know, pronouncements. Yeah? That one's alive and well, isn't it? Yeah? The other people create negative karma by killing us because we're the morally superior ones. But we don't create any negativity killing these infidels. Okay, thinking the mind is the brain is acquired wrong view. That one's pretty prominent, too. Okay. So I wonder, you know, they're going to come up with something and when your loved one dies, freeze, freeze, no, brain transplant. When your loved one dies, you know, transplant their brain into another body and then, you know, you have them back again. 
Yeah, I wonder if you need to get married again, if you, you know, they're in a different body, but, but with the same brain. Yeah, probably, yeah. It's good for the economy if, and if you have to have another wedding, yeah. Although I wonder, you know, if, if they clone people and then switch the brains around and things like that. Like, you know, do you have to pay a tax? <laughs> I have a clone and I want my clone's, you know, arm because my arm got injured. Do I have to, you know, what gives me right over the clone, clone's arm? Well, it's my arm. It came from my, my genes. So it doesn't matter that it's, there's another person, you know, who's experiencing the pain of losing their arm because they actually aren't another person, even though they think they are, because they have the same brain I have. Huh? Yeah, we're going to get into some really interesting uh, questions of ethics with what science is doing. Yeah, because they talk about, you know, cloning. It's, it's so great. Then, you know, you have cancer in one part of your body, you get the organ from your clone. But wait a minute, your clone is another living being. Or, or you know, otherwise, how do you clone them? They, they're a baby and then you freeze the baby? Or you let it grow up into an adult and then you keep it in cold temperature until you want the organ that it has? What about if it's in good health and, and, and or if it has an organ failure and it needs your health, your organ? Yeah, are you going to give it to your clone? I don't know. Okay. So although these particular manifestations of afflictions were not present in us at birth, they can still be extremely dangerous and harmful. When people are taught by friends, family, or society to adhere to acquired afflictions, wars, oppression, and environmental destruction easily, easily follow. Okay. Sages and tenant schools have different views regarding when afflictions are abandoned on the path. According to the Treasury of Knowledge, which was written by Vasubandhu, all five afflictive views and deluded doubt are abandoned on the path of seeing, okay, which would make them afflict, um, acquired afflictions. While the other four root afflictions, attachment, anger, ignorance, and arrogance, are abandoned on the path of meditation, which would make them innate. Okay. According, that's one view. According to the Ornament of Clear Realizations, Abhismaya Alankara, and the Prasangika view, deluded doubt, okay, wrong views, holding wrong views as supreme, and the view of rules and practices, those four, so three of them are types of afflictive views, and then, and then add diluted doubt. Those four are abandoned on the path of seeing, okay, which would make them acquired afflictions. This came up before, this question came up for, before, here's the answer. Whereas the acquired form of view of a personal identity and view of extremes are also abandoned on the path of seeing, and their innate forms are abandoned on the path of meditation. So it seems like, according to the ornament and the prasangikas, okay, um, deluded doubt, wrong views, Holding wrong views as supreme and rule of rules, view of rules and practices are only acquired afflictions. It seems that way. Okay. Whereas all the other ones, 
their acquired version is eliminated on the path of seeing and their innate version on the path of meditation. Okay, so that's the next sentence. The acquired forms of all other afflictions are born on the, are abandoned on the path of seeing and their innate forms are abandoned on the path of meditation. All afflictions have been, ab- have been eradicated at the time of becoming an arhat or an eighth ground bodhisattva. Okay, so those two, actually it's an arhat, an eighth ground, ninth ground, tenth ground bodhisattva. So those are there those four are still sentient beings. Okay. So, but they have all abandoned all the afflictions and the afflictive obscurations. Okay. They haven't abandoned the cognitive obscurations. Okay. So since direct realization of emptiness is needed to eliminate acquired afflictions, we should not underestimate their power to cause harm in this life and to create the causes to experience unfortunate rebirths. So abandoning acquired afflictions isn't just adopting the correct intellectual view, okay? Because the tendency is still there to, you know, you can, uh, you know, like this life, maybe we come to have the correct view of emptiness. But next life, we get born someplace and, you know, we're taught all about uh, a creator or the one universal mind or something, and we believe that. So although we may have suppressed acquired afflictions this lifetime, yeah, they haven't been thoroughly abandoned because next lifetime we can learn another version of them again. Okay, so only the direct realization of emptiness eliminates them. The Pali tradition does not have an explicit division into acquired and innate afflictions. However, some afflictions are said to be easier to eradicate than others. Some are abandoned by seeing, while others are abandoned by meditation. Okay. So the Pali tradition does not set out five paths as the Sanskrit tradition does, but it does speak of seeing and meditation. Okay, but not the paths of seeing or the the path of seeing or the path of meditation. So here I think my theory is you see some historical development. You know, early on people talked of seeing you know, nirvana, and then meditation on nirvana, but they didn't divide things into the five paths. Yeah. They, in the, in the Pali tradition, they, what they divide things into are the four pairs of approachers and, uh, abiders. Okay. So approacher and abider to, Stream entry, approacher and abider to once returner, approacher and abider to non returner, and approacher and abider to arhat. Okay, that's how they they set the path out. Okay, so the Sanskrit tradition accepts that version, but then it also describes five paths. Okay. Yeah, if you don't learn anything else from the Library of Wisdom and Compassion, hopefully you will learn that people have many different views (laughs) of the Dharma and of the path, even amongst Buddhist practitioners and learned Buddhist sages. Yeah, people have different views. But what's the one right one? What? What's your question? 
question is about these acquired afflictions. They we all they always say they are acquired in this life, mm -hmm. but definitely the imprints of what they're acquired this life go forward, right? I mean, one would if if you have strong beliefs in something, there could be a tendency to believe it again in next life. So when it, then when we read that the um, acquired ones are eliminated on the path of seeing, these acquired ones that are, are they talking about only the acquired ones that you required on that very life when you attain the path of seeing? No, or are they talking about no. all the little, all the, all the, all the Yeah, because you've realized emptiness. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, so. Yeah, it's the emphasis on the are acquired in this life part always confuses me about yeah. then, then what are we what are we yeah. removing at the path of seeing? No, then? you're getting rid of all of them. All the, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm. Okay, so the former, the afflictions that are banded by seeing in the Pali tradition are overcome by stream enters. And the afflictions um, abandoned by meditation are overcome by non-returners and arhats. Okay. Since stream enters realization of the unconditioned or nirvana is not as strong as that of non-returners and arhats, the fetters they abandon through this first seeing of nirvana, okay, and here are the feathers that the fetters that are abandoned, yeah, by the first seeing of nirvana, by the stream enters. View of a personal identity, diluted doubt, and view of rules and of practices. Okay? So the diluted doubt and views of rules and practices is similar to the Sanskrit tradition. But what's interesting here is how the Pali tradition thinks a view of a personal identity is very different than how the Sanskrit, especially the Prasangikas, think of that view. Okay, because the Prasangikas say the view of a personal identity is actually, it, it operates the same way as ignorance does, only it is uh, grasping onto our own individual I. But the way it operates and grasps as at uh, inherent existence is the same uh, as ignorance. Okay, but in the Pali tradition, view of a personal identity is not that strong because stream enters, you know, can can get rid of it. Okay, so uh, so the fetters that are abandoned through this first seeing of nirvana. View of a personal identity, diluted doubt, and view of rules and practices are not as ingrained as the rest of the fetters that are abandoned by meditation on the higher paths. Okay, so different perspective. Okay, so here's, here's a reflection. Are you doing the reflections as your homework? No? I hope so. I didn't write them for nothing, did I? Okay, so reflections. First one, what is the difference between innate and acquired afflictions? Mm -hmm. Then two, make examples in your life of acquired afflictions. Certain biases, prejudices, fears, resentments, or jealousies that you have learned from faulty philosophies or from listening to others who have those ideas. Okay, let's do that. Name some of the acquired afflictions that you have and where you got them or how you learned them. Yeah? that I continue to work on is that I was born inherently evil, inherently flawed, inherently sinful. Mm. And that I have to somehow redeem myself mm. to no avail. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you can hear, see here how even though those are acquired afflictions, they're, they're very powerful. America is the best country. <laughs> Mm 
Yeah. So a kind of, would that be like an acquired arrogance? Yeah. The best country. And you are a citizen of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Chinese language and culture are, and civilization is the greatest on this planet. <laughs> it was amazing. I when I met my family again recently, like not just my niece, like every child in the family now can recite the same poems. I don't know why they're being taught, like from by heart. But, yeah. But, so. <laughs> okay. So we see America, Chinese, Germany. <laughs> Early years, um, before the war, <laughs> hold on. Um, America is enemy number one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't trust them. <laughs> okay, so a kind of hate, a uh, kind of hostility. Yeah, I learned hostility. What else? Oh, nobody else has uh, acquired afflictions. Yes, New Zealand. No, Australia. Kangaroos are the best pets. <laughs> and then having one will cure you of COVID. <laughs> mm. I think one is body is beautiful, which is definitely supported by the beach culture in Australia. But yeah. also I think uh, the gender hierarchy of men are in control or men know uh -huh. better or are more intelligent or powerful and are the ones in charge. I've... That was, I have internalized that a fair amount. Yeah. Everything can be understood through science. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, could scientists explain the acquired afflictions? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then? Oh, you, no, but you don't have a, acquired afflictions. Yeah? Oh, I know yours. U.S. Border and Immigration Service Services stink. Um, <laughs> until after they let you in. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I was going to say that um, Colombians speak the best Spanish in, ah. <laughs> in all of South America. Yes. <laughs> Better, what about in Europe? Better than Spain? No, no, it's just in South America. Just in South America. <laughs> I, okay. yeah, I make that distinction. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> there is one right answer. Mm, there is one right answer. Yes. Children should be seen and not heard. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. How much, I mean, how we've internalized many of these things. Uh huh? Uh huh? Ice cream will bring happiness, <laughs> undoubtedly. Okay, that's not an affliction. Um, <laughs> no, you. but Attachment. you have to define it. Mint chocolate chip ice cream brings happiness. Oh, it doesn't have to be mint chocolate chip. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it could be chunky monkey. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so it's good to, to look, you know, what kind of biases and uh, assumptions and preconceptions do we have that we've just been taught, you know? I mean, this one where you said America is the greatest country. We were taught that all during school, weren't we? Yeah? And to, treat, to teach critical race theory jeopardizes that. Quite interesting, you know, to really look in, in our upbringing what things we have been inculcated with, to just assume and filter things through. Yeah. Okay, then uh, th point three. Consider the many reasons why, the, why these beliefs are false. Try to view those people or places yeah, that you have some kind of afflicted attitude towards from a different perspective so that your mind can be clearer and free from anxiety, bias, and incorrect conceptions. 
So one of them right now, yeah, acquired affliction and a kind of hostility, is Taliban cannot be trusted. It's, it's a kind, I mean, if you feel hostility towards the Taliban and, you know, discrimination, yeah, then it's an acquired form of, of uh, hostility, yeah. Yeah, any kind of discrimination that we have like that. Yeah, we learned it in this life, didn't we? Yeah, and it's a kind of form of anger. Okay, so so that was innate and acquired afflictions. Now we're going to talk about coarse and subtle afflictions. So coarse and subtle afflictions are spoken of primarily in the Prasangika school because its definition of ignorance and the object of negation when meditating on selflessness are unique. Lower Buddhist schools say that the ignorance that is the root of samsara grasps a self-sufficient, substantially existent person, whereas Prasangikas assert it grasps an inherent uh, it grasps inherent existence, you know, of all phenomena. Okay? So based on, on that, for, okay, so for them, the prasangikas, grasping a self-sufficient, substantially existent person is a coarse affliction. Okay? As are the anger, attachment, and other afflictions based on it. So... Uh, you know, we often have ignorance, then ignorance gives way to grasping a self-sufficient, substantially existent person, and then that produces attachment, anger, jealousy, arrogance, induced by the, the grasping at self-sufficient, substantially existent person. Okay, so all those things having to do with SSSE, yeah, are uh, are considered coarse afflictions from the prasangika view. Okay, so whereas the ignorance grasping inherent existence, as well as the afflictions based on it, are subtle afflictions. So all afflictions ultimately are based at grasping at inherent existence, but some afflictions arise directly from the grasping at inherent existence, and some you first gra- you grasp inherent existence, then self-sufficient, substantially assisted person, then the afflictions. So because the lower schools accept the inherent existence of persons and phenomena, they do not negate the afflictions based on it. Okay. So most of the afflictions ordinary beings experience on a daily basis are coarse ones. This is interesting, yeah? There is nothing subtle about a person who is exploding with anger or one overwhelmed by greed, okay? Most of our afflictions are out there, you know? (laughs) They're not so subtle. You know, and most of them are from, you know, thinking that there is this I that is different from the aggregates that is in control or should be in control. Okay. So it is possible to notice the subtle afflictions only after realizing the lack of a self sufficient, substantially existent person. Yeah. Okay, now, seeds, latencies, and having ceased. In contemplating, and this one has several um, subsections in it, Uh, in contemplating the Buddha's teachings, ancient Indian sages discussed many topics. One concerned continuity. How does a karmic action created in one life Bring a result in another life. Yeah, you change bodies. So what 
how you committed some action now, but your body isn't the same and your mind is immaterial and so on. So what carries the karma to the next life? How is that done? Okay, and this is this has been discussed since the Buddha's lifetime, I think. Okay, how can a mental factor such as anger or compassion be present in our mind streams one day, fade away, and then manifest the next day? How's that happen? Yeah, I mean, when they fade away, they aren't manifest in your mind. So do you still have them? Yeah? Or do they, they're just eradicated? Or do they go, you know, what happens to them? Yeah, they go underground until the next day and then come again? So this is where latency, seeds, and having ceased comes in. In his auto-commentary to the supplement, Chandrakirti says, that which pollutes the mind stream and also leaves imprints and causes the continuation of something is called a latency. Okay, so that's what a latency is. It pollutes the mind stream. It leaves imprints. Okay. Sometimes latency and imprints are, are synonymous, you know, and causes the continuation of something. So that's what a latency is. Other English synonyms for latency are predisposition, habitual tendency, imprint, and propensity. So you can get from these different translations that latency has a lot of different connotations, okay? It's, it's something that's latent there, that if it doesn't manifest, it predisposes you towards something. It's a habit, habitual tendency coming from the fat past. It's an imprint on your mind. It's a propensity. So each of these words kind of emphasize a different aspect of what a latency is. Okay, of the three types of impermanent phenomena, which are forms, consciousnesses, abstract composites, okay? Seeds and latencies are abstract composites. Okay, so the illumination, in illumination of the thought, what's the Tibetan title for that uh, text? Gompa Rapsal. Okay. Um, uh, Tsongkhapa says, of the two latencies, one that is a seed and the other that is non-seed, cognitive obscurations are the latter. So here's a division of latencies, okay? Some latencies are seeds. Some latencies are non-seed latencies, okay? So seed, the, the latencies that are seeds would be like uh, the seeds of afflictions, yeah, the seeds of karma, things like this. The non-seed latencies would be the cognitive afflictions. Okay, because, huh? Obscurations, yes, thank you, cognitive obscurations. Okay, so the cognitive obscurations are not afflictions. They're not karma. They're the latencies of afflictions. So there's... And when we talk of afflictions, there's the seed of afflictions and the latencies of afflictions. And they're different. Seed of afflictions is a, an afflictive obscuration. Latencies of afflictions is a cognitive obscuration. When we talk about karma, whether we say seeds of karma or latencies of karma, it all refers to the same thing. Basically, the, seed, the karmic seeds. 
Okay? So we can speak of latencies in two forms. Latencies in the form of seeds and latencies in the form of potencies. Okay? The latter are called non-seed latencies. Okay, so they're potencies. Yeah. When the word latency is used in general, it refers to both seed and non-seed latencies. Okay, but a seed is necessarily a latency, but a latency is not necessarily a seed. It could also be a non-seed latency. Okay. So how many P's are there? How many, uh, you know, points between seed and latency? Three. Okay, so what what is both a seed and a latency? Or what has both a seed and a latency? Or what is both a seed and a latency? Or has, whichever. Huh? Okay, so the seed of anger. It's... It's a seed and a latency, okay? Then what is a seed but not a latency? All seeds are latencies. What is a latency but not a seed? Cognitive obscurations. What are neither latencies or seeds? Form. Or afflictions, you could say. Yeah. Okay, so um, for the sake of ease, okay, in English, we'll call non seed latencies latencies to differentiate them from seeds. What does it say here? Okay, Chittamadrans, our friends, the Yogacharyans, have a complex presentation of seeds and latencies and how they produce both the object and the consciousness cognizing it. This explanation will be saved for a later volume in the series. <laughs> okay, but they do have quite a complex, you know, explanation of it. Okay. So, um, yeah, so seed has the connotation of being the cause of something, okay? Latency implies retaining uh, the potential or energy of something. Although the mind that gives rise to seeds and latencies may be virtuous or non-virtuous, the seeds and latencies themselves are neutral. So you'll often hear people say the uh, negative seeds of karma or the positive seeds of karma. That's incorrect. The seeds are not negative or, or positive. We should say the seeds of positive karma, the seeds of negative karma, because the karma is the one that is virtuous or non-virtuous, not the seed. But seeds are very powerful. Yeah, they're quite powerful. Okay, so now first we'll talk about afflictions and their seeds. Okay. So afflictions arise in our minds in a manifest and active form. We become angry, jealous, greedy, or lazy, and we act motivated by these manifest afflictions. However, even though we haven't eliminated anger from our mind stream completely, we aren't always angry. We may be sitting calmly, But when someone criticizes us, our anger is triggered and becomes manifest. Okay, so what connects the prior and latter instances of anger? I was angry yesterday, 
because somebody, you know, didn't water the flowers properly or why, you know, or who knows what, or I'm mad at the flowers themselves because they aren't growing the way I want them to. Okay, and so then, so that's yesterday. Then today, you know, I'm, I'm angry at the Taliban. Okay, so what, so there's an instance, uh, an instance of anger yesterday, another one today. They're both anger, but in between those two, there was no manifest anger. But it wasn't like my anger became totally non-existent during that time. Why? Because the uh, potency, the seed of the anger was, uh, was still there. Okay, so it was just very, you know, the anger had gone into a seed form, so it wasn't manifest. But then, I'm so super sensitive to everything people say, you know, the moment they say something I don't like, bleh, okay, so what connects one moment of anger to the next, that's the seed of the anger. Okay. So, uh, what connects the prior and latter instances of anger? This is the function of the seed of anger. When manifest anger subsides, the seed of anger remains on our mind stream. The seed provides for the continuity of anger in our mind streams, even when anger is not manifest. Okay, so the absence of a manifest emotion does not mean, or a manifest view or attitude, does not mean that you no longer have that in your mind stream. Okay, the seed of anger is not anger. It is not an affliction, although it is the substantial cause for anger to arise again. Because without the seed of anger... If, if you had one instance of anger and there were no seed of anger, then even if somebody beat you up the next day, you wouldn't get angry because the seed of anger would be missing. Okay? Both anger and the seed of anger are afflictive obscurations and are not fully abandoned until we attain liberation or the eighth bodhisattva ground. Okay, so we cannot assignment, so is that clear for people? You know, we have to kind of go over this again and again to see, you know, okay, afflictions, we give the seed of the affliction, which can cause manifest affliction later on, okay? And when I die, it's the seed of the afflictions that go from one lifetime to the next, okay? Because... As we go through the death absorptions, you know, the ability to be angry absorbs, yeah? When you're at the clear light of death, there's no anger, okay? But there's still the seed of the anger in the mind stream for ordinary beings. And then when you're reborn, that seed of anger will again produce manifest anger or greed or whatever it is. Okay. So we cannot simultaneously experience two manifest mental states that are contradictory. Okay. We cannot be angry and loving at the ex at exactly the same moment. Okay. So you know, sometimes you may be in a quarrel with somebody that you really care about. And one moment you look at them and you're like, oh, I really care about them. And the next moment, but they said this and you hate them. And then the next moment is, but I really care about them. And the next moment is, ah, they're driving me nuts. Okay. So the loving and the, <laughs> and the aversion are, do not happen at the same moment because those two afflictions are contradictory. You can't feel two opposite afflictions for the same person at the same time. 
But what's happening is you have one, then the other, one, then the other, one, then the other. It goes back and forth relatively quickly. Okay. When we are loving, anger is not manifest in our minds, but we haven't totally eliminated anger from our mind streams either. The seed of anger remains in our mind streams when love is manifest and it connects one instance of anger to the next. So love can be manifest and then but the seed of the anger or the seed of resentment is still there in the mind. It hasn't been lost. Both innate and acquired afflictions have an aspect that is manifest and an aspect that is a seed. Okay, so we're going to have all sorts of different permutations of things here. Okay, so manifest innate attachment arises in our minds from seeing an attractive object. Okay, it is a consciousness whereas its seed, the potential set on the mind stream from a previous moment of attachment that can produce a future moment of attachment, okay, that potential is an abstract composite, which is an impermanent phenomena that is neither form nor consciousness. Okay. Manifest acquired afflictive obscurations are afflictions that are manifest in the mind due to learning incorrect ideas. If we read about a cosmic mind from which our minds originate at birth and dissolve back into at death and then believe that exists, that wrong view is a manifest acquired affliction. The seed of that is a potential that can produce another moment of this incorrect belief in the future. Okay. The seed of anger is not what psychologists call repressed anger. Okay, Having the seed of anger does not mean there is low-grade anger in our minds all the time. Okay, So the seed of anger is not like an angry mood, like you wake up in a bad mood, you know, there there's some degree of manifest affliction present, but the seed is not that, okay? And what people call repressed anger, like you're angry, you know, when, when I, I don't know how psychologists think of it, I'll, I'll ask one in a moment, but how I think of it as a, you know, a person, you know, repressed anger, it gives to me the notion that there's anger, you know, some kind of ma an anger there that I'm not really acknowledging because I'm pushing it down. And at any particular moment, if I don't push hard enough, boom, you know, it's, it's going to explode because it's been repressed or suppressed. Okay, psychological viewpoint. Yes, I think that's true, but also there's another form of it where a person will repress their anger and they do a really good job of it, but that tension, that energy mm -hmm. comes out in their blood pressure. They have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So it comes that way mm -hmm. often. Yeah, but there is the thing, like it's, Underneath, you're really angry, and you're just sitting on it. So the anger is there, manifest, but somehow you're controlling it. But if you don't control it hard enough, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So having the seed of anger does not mean that there is low-grade anger in our minds all the time. Rather, it simply means that the potential to become angry again exists in our mind streams, even though we are not angry now. Okay. Let's just, are there questions? I should leave. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. I'll just mark this place. Okay.
Yeah. Uh -huh. When it says that innate and acquired afflictions have an aspect that is manifest and an aspect that is a seed, to me that's like saying that uh, afflictions which are consciousness have an aspect that is consciousness and an aspect that's an abstract composite. No, no. Uh, the, the way it was originally written was without the word aspect. But Geshe-la wanted the word aspect in there. <laughs> uh -huh. I think what, what aspect is just doing is saying, you know, not, it, it, it's saying that, that there's, you know, something that resembles or carries the potency of anger. Yeah, Relate, it shows some relationship. So I'm interested in acquired afflictions. If you grow up in a family where uh, what you're taught is to be prejudiced against certain groups, and you don't adopt that, mm -hmm. what's what's functioning there? What's working? And especially when you were very little. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. So you were taught some kind of totally incorrect view when you're little, but you... Don't adopt it, okay? Because you have some wisdom, yeah? You think about, the you know, some incorrect ideology or incorrect way of thinking was presented to you, and then the you have wisdom in your mind, that mental factor of wisdom, so you check if that ideology makes sense or doesn't make sense, and you decide it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so you leave it. So that's why we have to plant lots of, we have to increase uh, our seed of intelligence and anger, of intelligence and wisdom in this lifetime. So it will be strong enough in case future lifetimes we learn all sorts of garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, when it talks about volitional actions, and that's karma, mm -hmm. what does volitional mean exactly? Does a person always have to be fully conscious or have an intention to do something? There has to be some intention, yeah. Now, whether we always are 100% aware of our intention, that's another story, yeah. Because sometimes... Uh, you know, the let's say an affliction or something comes so quickly and so powerfully that we just act it out right away. Yeah, but the intention is definitely there, but the it may the sequence may go so quickly that we say, "Oh, but I didn't intend to do that," but there was some intention that led to to that. If you had a brain transplant, would the new brain be a new eye? I don't think so. Oh, you mean your new? You had a new eye in the in the body, in the body. I, I think you'd probably be dead having a brain transplant. <laughs> you know, but um, uh, you know, I think it, yes, I think it would be a different eye. It wouldn't be the same eye even though your body's the same. Mm -hmm. What is repressed depression? Repressed depression. Okay, our psychologist never heard of it. Is depression an affliction? I don't think depression itself is an affliction. I think that there can be a lot of low-grade, uh, or, or not necessarily low-grade, but some kind of manifest afflictions that are there when the, there's depression. You know, it seems to me depression is, is more an unpleasant sensation. It would belong more in the feeling category, but the afflictions, I would think, could, uh, you know, factor into that unpleasant feeling that you have. Although, you know, when you're depressed, there's certainly a lot of thoughts in there, too. 
you know, I feel awful, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, think I'll eat some worms. That's why you take the worm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think, you know, there, there's certain beliefs that are, you know, in the, that can be in the depressed mind. And there are also different kinds of depression, the kind that, you know, depend on chemicals in the brain are probably different than the kind of depression that happens when you're grieving or, uh, you know, other situations. Mm -hmm. According to the quote by Chandra Kirti, Kirti on page 127, does it mean that all latencies necessarily pollute the mind stream, including imprints of faith and compassion? Um, Pollute the mind stream. I noticed that when I was reading it, too. Um, no, I don't think he would say the, the latencies of compassion pollute the mind stream. Yeah. Because, you know, it's... So what is called... This is the definition of latency, you know? So would he say... Because... Uh, Compassion doesn't pollute the mind stream. So would he say there's no latency of compassion? Well, you know, he would probably say there is the seed of compassion, definitely. There's the seed of compassion. But if we talk about, you know, usually the latencies of uh, are, are things that uh, are cut, many of the latencies like the latencies of afflictions are cognitive obscurations. Compassion is not a cognitive obscuration. Okay, compassion can continue on the, all the way to awake, awakening. So definitely the seed of, of uh, compassion would be there. Mm -hmm. If we can't get rid of our anger, even if we try very hard, it still comes and goes. Do the seeds keep growing? Would it be better to leave the situation so we stop planting more seeds? Uh, you can leave the situation and still be very angry and increase the strength of your seed of anger, even if you leave the situation. So you have to figure out, you know, you have to practice the antidotes to anger when you're not angry. And then when, if anger comes in a situation, then you have to think of, uh, in that situation, what is the best way to handle it? And sometimes, you know, if you're just, if you see that your mind is so angry that you can't take in any new information, then, you know, you need, if it's the situation permits, you need to say, you know, I'm really angry now. I need to kind of go and calm down. I'll come back and talk to you later. Okay. Um, other times you're angry, and uh, but you know you can maybe still listen to the other person and practice re reflective listening and so on. Yeah. So the behavior when you're in an afflicted state, it depends very much on a specific situation who you're mad at, whether you're in the room with them, or what else is going on, you know, there's there's not one uh, thing that that is good for every every situation of anger. Except the meditation on emptiness, if you can use it. And that's the best one, but most of us can't do that yet. If I understand this, is that Afflictive obscurations are latencies. No, afflictive ob uh, afflictive obscurations, which is the, the are ca are afflictions, and the seeds of affliction. Okay. So I'm still not quite clear on because a latency implies re has a potentiality too, but I keep yeah. hearing potential with the seeds. I'm a little... Yeah, yeah. Seeds have potentials too. You know, you, you grow the garden and the seeds mm -hmm. you plant have the potential to sprout for a plant. Mm 
Right, but then what are the, the latencies there? There's there, still... there some other kind of potency. Okay, and that also goes in the clear light at the time of death. They also continue in the continuity of the mind yeah. stream along with the seeds, along yeah. with the karma. Yeah. It's going back to the beginning um, where it says the uh, karma, I'll say karmic seeds cannot ripen into dukkha without the presence of afflictions. Mm -hmm. Does this mean there's always a manifest affliction? when like um, an unpleasant feeling is arising or when you experience some suffering? Um, I don't think necessarily, but it just means there's afflictions, you know, in, in the mind. It, it, what it means is, what I, I had explained before, that if your mind is free of all afflictions, then... Any karma you have that would produce a rebirth cannot manifest. It has to, it has to ripen in a mind with affliction, because uh, cra um, craving and clinging, the seventh and eighth links, no, seventh, eighth and ninth links, yeah, eighth and ninth links of the twelve, those are both afflictions, and they're what make a karmic seed ripen that throws the rebirth. Okay. So they're manifest afflictions. Uh, he, th Instead those are man those are manifest afflictions. But for example, uh, you know, you can get sick while you're asleep and you don't have a manifest affliction while you're sleeping, but your stomach could start hurting then or a cold could start coming on then. So could you say that that's because that you still have the seeds of afflictions is why that negative karma could still ripen? Well, the, ne what, the negative karma, the seeds of afflictions produce the suffering situation. Not the seed of afflictions. The seeds of karma are what bring the suffering feeling. Okay. So if you don't have seeds of kar karma, yeah, then you're not good. The seeds of karma bring happy feelings. They bring suffering feelings. They can bring neutral feelings, okay, depending of, on whether the karma was virtuous, non-virtuous, or unspecified. Okay? Okay. So lots to think about. Maybe sit and, and play around and try and think of examples of, you know, what is an afflictive, uh, obscurate, you know, the permutations between afflictive obscurations and uh, uh, seeds of afflictions. Yeah. Or what, yeah, just take some of these different categories and play around with them. And see if you know if you can name things that are both one or the other or neither. Okay, <laughs> that gets you to think more deeply about it. Yeah, and uh, you know when we were studying debate, we learned all about uh, spiders that are at an arachnid, arach, arach, arachnids, arachnids. Anyway, okay, the species that spiders belong to. Right, yeah. So there's things that are both that are uh, arachnids, but not spiders, such as a tick. There's a thing that are spider. There, there are nothing that is a spider, but not an arachnid. Reckon it. And thank goodness there's things that are neither.